156 years since Richard Gatling patented world's first machine gun. Richard Gatling was an Indianapolis-based inventor and physician. He invented the first rapid-fire weapon that was later called the Gatling gun. Gatling received a patent for this weapon on November 4, 1862. The patent was later sold to Colt Weapons Company in Connecticut. The Gatling gun was used in a number of armed conflicts by the U.S. forces. It was used in the American Civil War of the 1860s by the Union forces. The weapon was also used by the Boston War, Anglo-Zulu War, and Spanish-American War. The spectacle lynchings of an entire city of Hebrew Israelites, Negroes, in Wilmington, North Carolina, November 10th, 1898. If you spend even a little bit of time at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, it won't be long before you hear a certain last name. The name Keenan is very prominent on the campus. We have dozens of named professorships, Keenan professors. Keenan professors of this and that. We have a Keenan Arts Center. There's also Keenan Memorial Stadium, the home of the North Carolina Tar Heels football team since 1927. Carolina with the Tar Heels taking the field here at Keenan Stadium. But despite the ubiquity of the name, few students at UNC know much about the Keenans. In many ways, the Keenan's history is a lot like that of every other old rich family connected to any other university. Here's UNC history professor William Sturkey. One of the Keenans ceremoniously gave a brick in 1793 or about then that was used to help establish the university or help expand the university during its early years. Just here, here's a brick. Now start naming everything after me. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the brick was, you know, ceremonial. I think there was actually a financial contribution as well. I would hope you don't just take bricks from anybody. <laughs> the Keenans were not just anybody, though. So the Keenan family has been prominent in the state of North Carolina since at least the 18th century. They were major landowners and major slaveholders in the eastern part of the state. At this point, you may think you know where this is going. A southern university, a slave-owning family, some old buildings with their names on them, and you have all the ingredients for a 21st century culture war. But that's not exactly the case here. Almost everything named Keenan at UNC was named after industrialist William Rand Keenan Jr., class of 1894, who gave nearly $100 million to the university. But when it came time to name the new football stadium in 1927, William Rand Keenan Jr. did not want it named after himself. Yes, he um, dedicated the stadium to his father, William Rand Keenan Sr., who was the son of the last generation of slave owners in the family. Tell me a little bit about him. Well, I mean, I think the most consequential act in his life, at least in terms of consequences for other people's lives and for state politics, was his participation in the 1898 Wilmington Massacre. To understand the Wilmington Massacre, it's important to understand the political climate that led to it. The 15th Amendment, giving black men the right to vote, was ratified in 1870. Almost immediately, there was a backlash. Poll taxes, literacy tests, and intimidation by the Ku Klux Klan were largely successful in preventing blacks from gaining political power, but not everywhere. In some places, such as eastern North Carolina, blacks gained considerable political power during Reconstruction, like in Wilmington, then North Carolina's largest city. UNC history professor Harry Watson explains that there, a coalition of poor white populists and poor black Republicans took control of the city's government. Which was extremely unwelcome to the white establishment that dominated the Democratic Party in those days. Blacks and their political allies controlled the mayor's office, the city council, and the police force. There was even a black-owned newspaper, The Daily Record, which rivaled the white-owned Wilmington Messenger for influence. 
the situation in Wilmington was, in most respects, exactly what the passage of the 15th Amendment had promised. And in Wilmington, which is where the majority of black political power was concentrated, a group of wealthy whites, including William Rand Keenan Sr., essentially decided that they were going to overthrow this government, right, that was influenced by black voters. So uh, they basically staged a coup d'etat. That's not hyperbole. It was a literal coup d'etat, the only successful one to ever take place on American soil. They armed themselves, uh, surrounded the city hall, and told the government inside the, the city council that they would have to resign one man at a time and elect a replacement member according to the dictates of this mob. White Democrats took control of the city under threat of force. That threat would soon turn to reality. The next day, the mob reassembled and marched on the black-owned newspaper and burned it to the ground. The burning of the record was just the beginning of the violence, and William Rand Keenan Sr. played a particularly significant and deadly role in what followed. He had the rank of captain in this militia company, he was given the responsibility of commanding the machine gun wagon. This crowd actually had bought a machine gun and installed it on the back of a horse-drawn wagon, and Captain Keenan commanded the group of men who drove it into action, and it is believed that they opened fire at an intersection and killed 25 people at once. So this was not just a a sort of impulsive mob with, with sticks and, and pitchforks. This was no, more no, no. of a, it was a military It was a very operation. well-planned military operation. Most historians agree that at least 60 people died, but possibly hundreds. Spotty records make a specific count impossible. Hundreds more black citizens, mostly journalists and business and political leaders, fled the city. Once the white supremacist grasp on power was secured, they implemented the sorts of Jim Crow laws that had taken hold elsewhere in the South, disenfranchising blacks for the next 67 years. But they didn't just take control of the government in Wilmington. They also took control of the narrative about how they achieved it. Professor William Sturkey again. It was often quite referred to as a disturbance or a race riot or just, you know, some sort of incident that came up between blacks and whites. And it had this unfortunate, you know, result, but ultimately that the whites were justified, that the white leaders were justified in the use of force because the black people had just gotten out of control. And so that's largely how it was talked about. There's no mention of William Rand Keenan Sr.'s role in the massacre on the memorial to him that has stood in Keenan Stadium for decades. A plaque briefly describing the history of the Keenan family refers to their having made their fortune in oil and railroads, but makes no mention of the family's slave-owning past and certainly does not mention the Wilmington Massacre. In September, I published an article about the man Keenan Stadium was named after. A week later, the UNC student newspaper, The Daily Tar Heel, followed up with a striking front page. It was a big aerial shot of the stadium, and it said something to the effect of William Rand Keenan Sr. was involved in an 1898 massacre that murdered 60 to 300 African Americans. Our stadium is named after him. The coverage struck a nerve, but the question remained whether the university would do anything about it. A few weeks before my story, protesters toppled a Confederate military monument on campus called Silent Sam. For years, the university had refused to address complaints about it. Then there was the case of the building formerly known as Saunders Hall, named after Ku Klux Klan leader William Saunders. And it's not just that he played a role in the Klan, it's that when the building was dedicated, the Board of Trustees actually said, we're dedicating this to him to honor him in large part because he played this role in the Ku Klux Klan. Saunders Hall was changed to Carolina Hall in 2015. That move was accompanied by a 16-year moratorium on renaming any other buildings or moving or taking down any other monuments or memorials. And just last February, before he became aware of William Rand Keenan Sr.'s role at Wilmington, Professor Sturkey spearheaded a motion to get the plaque at the stadium, the one that mentioned the Keenan's history in oil and railroads, amended to acknowledge their history as slave owners. The motion was buried by the university. They didn't want a plaque outside the stadium that said anything about, you know, the stadium being named after people who were connected with slave money. All of which made what happened after the reports of Keenan Sr.'s role in the Wilmington Massacre pretty surprising. I said to myself and maybe to a friend, they better change that stadium to Keenan Jr. right away. And it turned out that's exactly what they did. Yeah, boy, lightning speed. They decided to go ahead and address that. 
Two weeks after my story was published, UNC Chancellor Carol Folt released a statement announcing that the plaques memorializing William Rankine and Sr. would be changed. They would remove the honorific reference to him and instead focus on his son, William Rankine and Jr., to tell, quote, the full and complete history. Whether that will merely be the full and complete history of William Rankine and Jr. with the Keenan family's sordid history whitewashed is unclear, but Professor Sturkey has an idea about what he'd like to see happen. And I would go through a complete reevaluation of every single building name, and I'm not sure that I would change the building names. I'm not sure that I would have taken the plaque off of Keenan Stadium, honestly. Rather than remove the old names, which some critics characterize as erasing history, Professor Sturkey wants to do the opposite. And so I would definitely add another plaque on the side of the stadium. I would explain why we had the first plaque. I would explain why we got the second plaque. And then I would I'd probably add another one that just lists the, the people that the Keenan family owned. The thing is, is that that's a bit more uncomfortable than just changing a name, obviously. And it's just something that a lot of people don't want to be confronted with in their daily lives. But of course, you know, I'm an African-American historian walking around the campus. I see the ghosts everywhere. William Rand Keenan Sr. Also known as Captain William R. Keenan. The man who was in command of the rapid fire gun stationed in Wilmington, North Carolina to overall Negroes. William Rand Keenan Sr. To the far right you see the Keenan family, a host of brothers and they were slave owners. They were slavers. They were slave masters. These people burned down the Manly Brothers Printing Company or Newspaper Company. It was called the Daily Record. William Rand Keenan was the commander of the white supremacist paramilitary force which massacred scores of black residents of Wilmington, North Carolina on a single bloody day in 1898. Men gathered outside the burned remains of Wilmington's black owned newspaper, the Daily Record, Library of Congress. Horrible butcheries at Wilmington. The Turks outdone. Innocent and unarmed colored men shot down. Hundreds run to the woods. The mob captures the town. White ministers, aiders and abettors of murder. The governor powerless. And the president of the United States silent. God's aid implored. The cries of defenseless anarchy rules. The cries of defenseless because anarchy rules. This is in the Richmond, Virginia newspaper, Saturday, November 19th. 1898. This is an article about the massacre that took place. The bloody massacre that took place of the KKK white supremacy, the fusionist government, Democratic and Republican government here in the United States of America, where there was nothing done to save and or to help our people, Israelites, Negroes, Hebrew Israelites. This massacre, Red Summer Massacre, or the end of the season 
massacre took place in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. There are little to no black businesses in Wilmington, North Carolina right now as we speak. And at this time, there were the majority, two thirds of the town was black owned or Israelite owned businesses and entrepreneurs, as well as many other leading positions in the town, town politics, government politics, municipalities, developments. This town was a predominantly black city or black town that had leadership of Hebrew Israelite or Negro ancestry, people that were free from the plantations. They had a free life and they also had the right to vote. However, white supremacists, the KKK, the fusionists, the government, the government assisted and encouraged and energized these individuals that are now namely, their names are monikered. The Keenan name is monikered on football fields in North Carolina, on Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Their names are all over. Their names are literally the slave masters. These are mass murderers and they are heralded and lauded as being some form of superhero as though they saved the town, as though they saved the state, as though they've done some great, wonderful thing. They've done nothing but massacred and destroyed human beings. These people will pay and their families are alive now and many of their other cohorts that were with them in these massacres, their families will pay for the wrong that they have done in 1898 and for a hundred years thereafter. They never restored those people, those so-called colored men that they shot down. They removed people from their houses, home invasions. They used the Gatling gun. The Gatling gun is a machine gun that shoots rounds more. Than, they can shoot a thousand rounds per minute. So these people went into Wilmington and riddled the so-called black or colored neighborhoods the Hebrew Israelites, okay, riddled their neighborhoods, shot them down, as well as they that escaped and ran into the woods. They never made it back into their town because it was completely taken over by these white supremacists, by these Ku Klux Klan members. Don't ever forget. This is in the archives. This is in the annals of American history. There has been a bloody massacre of Negroes, Israelites, spectacle lynchings of 
our ancestors in virtually every state in this country, every southern state for sure, also all the way up to Mississippi, to the Canadian border, these people have massacred our people for hundreds of years. Hundreds. Don't forget, these are horrible butcheries. Horrible butcheries. Spectacle lynchings are horrible butcheries for the public to see, for the public to know about it. And the U.S. presidents have done nothing. They don't do anything. So get that understanding, people. They do not do anything. The U.S. government, these government officials do not stop these Ku Klux Klan or supremacists from destroying our people. These people are yet alive and or their children or grandchildren are alive today keeping this behavior going on. We pray for La'iwalam Shabbat, eternal rest for the Manly Brothers and their respective Hebrew Israelite families. We also pray for the 300 or more respective Hebrew Israelite families without names who was exiled from ownership and freedom in Wilmington, North Carolina. We say, La'iwalam Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. for those families, respectively.